It's Entomology Animated, celebrating the amazing biology of insects using the power of digital animation. Ding. Computer graphics software, the same technology used to create movie monsters and video game heroes, can also be used as a powerful tool for scientific visualization. This video documents the process I use to create this accurate and realistic rainbow scarab beetle. The digital tools I use to create this insect study are actually not that different from more traditional tools. I start with a ball of digital clay. While I may not be able to touch this clay with my hands, I use a stylus and a tablet to push and pull and carve the surface. The surface itself is a mesh of virtual polygons. I use sculpting brushes to manipulate the surface, starting with the body of Phineas Vindex. I sculpted the pronotum, thorax, and abdomen as a single surface, and then I added the head as a separate surface and pulled out the long horn that you often see in the male of the species. I added little blobs for eyes and shaped the parts of the head that go around the eyes. The process of making this 3D model is an incredibly fascinating look into the architecture of insect morphology. The shapes that make up this beetle remind me of modern sculptural pieces. I would call them abstract art, except that every part is functional, shaped by evolutionary processes over millions of generations. It's actually the opposite of abstract. Once I get to the point where I feel like the proportions are accurate enough, I can split the model into separate pieces so that I can focus on the parts individually. The smooth mesh of the abdomen that you see in front of you is made up of millions of polygons. The sculpting software that I'm using is called ZBrush. The time-lapse video makes it look pretty easy, but I've been using this software for about 16 years, and it's taken a long time to build up the kind of confidence that's needed to create a model as complex as this beetle. I love sculpting insects and arachnids. I never get tired of it. The shapes are so pleasing, and they form such an interesting puzzle. Beetles in particular have some of the most amazing shapes. I often wonder while I'm sculpting what advantages these particular forms provide the beetle. The legs of this rainbow scarab are really wild. They almost look like a cartoon. Uh, it's not shown in this video, but I am able to trace diagrams of the legs directly in the sculpting software, and this ensures that I'm getting the pieces the right size and shape. You could be forgiven for thinking that I'm making this stuff up, but no, the legs of this beetle really do look like this. These guys are dung beetles, so they do a lot of digging and they handle a lot of poop. Given that, it seems logical that their limbs kind of look like an alien's version of a Swiss army knife. The antenna of this beetle are pretty crazy looking too. I start out with a blob and carve some lines for the various segments at the end of the antenna. And then I added a series of cup-like blobs for each of the segments of the antenna. And they, these lead back to the head. So like many scarab beetles, the antenna of the rainbow scarab fold up neatly underneath the shield-like head. Mouth parts for beetles are difficult because good reference imagery for a particular species can be hard to find. Luckily, I was able to find some nice images online of a dissected rainbow scarab beetle. Most beetles have the same types of mouth parts, but the shapes and sizes of these mouth parts can vary wildly from one species to the next. I always try and get things as accurate as I can, but it's a learning process, and each time I make a new model, I learn a lot more and I get a little bit better. Without a doubt, my favorite part of making these models is detailing. I can use procedural fractal algorithms built into my sculpting tools to help me match the type of details I see on the surface of my beetles in the reference photos. The type of detail on the surface is a big part of the personality of how each species of insect looks. I generally experiment a lot with a variety of techniques within the software to try and capture that specific personality of detail. So you can see at this point, I think my model is kind of it's shaping up, but we still have a ways to go. Whenever I start a project like this, I always try and get as much reference as possible. Photographs are good, but nothing beats having the actual insect in your hands. So I ordered a few of them online. I like the Butterfly Company. Uh, when I get the beetles, I'll put them under my microscope so I can get a better look. Not being formally trained as an entomologist, I kind of learn this stuff as I go. But when it gets to the fiddly bits, I'm not always sure what I'm looking at, even if I'm looking at it under my microscope. But I can't think of a more fun way to learn this stuff than by making a model like this. I also take a lot of my own photographs. Uh, it's better to photograph live insects, but that's not always possible. Taking my own pictures is helpful because I can get as many views as I need. Uh, it's also a good idea to watch videos of the insects, which you can usually find online. 
seeing the insects in motion reveals a lot about the forms that you don't usually pick up from looking at a dead bug. The area around the eyes is very interesting, and I had to do it several times over to get it right. At least I think I got it right. I'm getting it closer to right. Uh, it appears as if the eye is sticking out both on the top and on the bottom. This must give the beetle a really interesting view of the world. I wonder what the differences are between the structure of the omatidia on the top of the eye versus the omatidia on the bottom. The omatidia are the hexagonal structures you see on the surface of the eye that lead to the optic nerve. The elytra is the shield that covers the wings of the beetle, and I wanted to try and match the look of the detail that I see in my reference as closely as possible. It took several passes to get the detail looking right. I used special tools to mask the cavities of the surface so that I could enhance what I've already modeled, and I'm using a lot of my own special tricks that I've developed over the years to get this style of detail. It makes a huge difference when you try and get it right. It really boosts the realism of the final rendered version. Detailing the legs took a lot of tries and experiments. The detail on one part of the body is going to have a different personality from the details on another part of the body. So I often need to develop different techniques to create the various different looks to the detail on the surface. And of course, I'm also trying to capture the quality or the texture of the chitin that forms the exoskeleton uh, of the insect. Uh, and that's a really interesting challenge, uh, something, again, I hardly ever get tired of doing because it's always a neat challenge. Of course, sculpting the forms is just the first half of the project. Once the model is sculpted, it's time to paint it. To do this, I use different software to create the colors and material qualities in the aptly named Rainbow Scarab Beetle. I'm using Substance Painter, which is a popular program used by artists in the video game industry. I'm not just painting colors, though. I'm also trying to match that metallic quality of the surface. To do this, I'm taking advantage of a material quality known as metallicity. Materials made from metal and materials that look like metal often have a tinted reflected highlight. If you think of a blue ball with a pure white highlight, that will look very plastic. Now imagine the same blue ball and imagine tinting the highlight blue as well. The more that the highlight is tinted, the more metallic the surface will look. This is because of the way that light is refracted as it bounces off of the surface and back into the environment. The layers of chitin that form the exoskeleton are made of structures that also affect the refraction of light, so we see a shiny, iridescent, metallic surface on our beetle. So what I'm doing is painting colors on the surface, and at the same time I'm also varying the intensity of the metallicity. You can see in my model and in the reference that some parts of the exoskeleton are very metallic while other parts look a bit more plastic. This seems to vary from one individual to the next, but with some consistency. There are also some metallic parts on the legs and on the bottom of the thorax. Once again, I get a chance to work on details, which is always so much fun. I'm using the sculpted details of the surface that I created in ZBrush as an input for the details that I'm painting in Substance Painter. I enjoy trying to create a weathered, imperfect surface with lots of organic variation. Uh, I would like the surface of the beetle to reveal something about uh, how the beetle lived, just like the wrinkles on a character's face, tells you a little bit about their life story. So in my opinion, the only thing that really separates digital art from a traditional approach is the tools themselves. From an artistic standpoint, it's still about the decisions made by the artist. The artist still has to study the reference imagery, has to learn about light, has to solve problems, has to learn how to define forms, but most importantly, the artist has to learn what they want their art to say. For me, the point of making a super realistic study of an insect is the process itself. The end result of this is not going to be that much different than what you get with a, a digital camera and a beetle in front of you. And photographing a beetle takes a lot less time and effort than making a digital sculpture. So in this case, it's the process. The process is more important than the result. Just like a painter who paints a bowl of fruit, it's the exercise, the deep dive into this kind of realistic recreation that allows the artist to meditate on the intense creativity and ingenuity of the natural world. So the decisions that I make when creating my art are driven by the desire to explore and celebrate biodiversity. In particular, I like to explore the little-known alien world of invertebrates, but of course I have to throw in the occasional reptile as well. 
If I can get a, a viewer of my art to contemplate the world from a non-anthropocentric point of view, even for just a moment, then I would consider my art to be successful. So the entertainment industry has created a demand for engaging and immersive imagery. The resulting tools become both more powerful and easier to use as the industry evolves. I think these tools are also perfect for illustrating complex scientific concepts in ways that can be accessible to a general audience. In addition, the process of actually making an accurate digital model of an insect or another organism in this way offers a unique learning experience for students, possibly more so than dissection of actual animals. At the moment, of course, there's not much of an educational infrastructure available to give students this experience, but perhaps in the future. So once I've finished creating the beetle model and painting it and getting it ready for rendering, I like to create a rig so that I can create a pose and possibly even animate uh, the beetle. And to do this, I use Maya. Uh, you can use other software packages, including Blender, which is free, to do this same kind of thing. I just use Maya because I've been using it forever. A rig generally is made up of joints, which are these little triangular objects, and you use them to create a hierarchy, and then you bind each of the parts of the beetle to those joints. So then I make some custom controls, and I can actually manipulate the beetle, move it around, and make it do actually anything that I want it to. That's one distinct advantage from creating a model like this. But there's one major thing that this model is still missing, and that is hair. Hair is the one thing that really adds that extra touch of realism because most organisms are hairy in one way or another. So you can see from this model, I've got it covered in these little fibers. And I use this software to simply paint it onto the surface. So for example, if I select this surface, I'll make it paintable. And then I can use a paintbrush-like tool to literally draw the hairs on. You can see them right there. And I just painted it all over the bottle and then converted it into geometry and applied a shader to the geometry so that it would render and look like realistic hair. For my final render, I brought the beetle into a scene in Maya and I added some mushrooms. So I added the mushrooms just because I wanted something nice for the beetle to sit on while the camera rotates around and takes its picture. I also have some lighting set up, kind of like a virtual simulation of what you find in a studio. The mushrooms came from a website called Quixel Megascans. So this is a service. These guys go around and they scan all kinds of different objects throughout the world. And when you subscribe to this service, you can download these various models and bring them into a scene. It makes for a really nice natural environment. It's really cool stuff. I don't know if the beetle likes to sit on top of mushrooms, but I'm guessing that throughout the day, the beetle must encounter a few mushrooms and maybe one of them probably does sit on top of it. Who knows, but I thought it'd make a nice, interesting image. I also added some simple water drops here, which are just spheres with a nice water shader applied to them. And that helps give the scene a sense of scale, plus a little bit of more kind of visual interest. So I set up a camera, which is kind of a virtual version of like a movie camera, and then with my light, my shaders, my mushrooms, and everything else, I have it into a scene and I can create a render by clicking on this button right here. And then the computer goes through the process of calculating the surfaces, the materials, how the light interacts with those surfaces, as well as other effects like depth of field blurring and some volumetric effects. Basically, whatever I set up, just like in a camera studio, but it's all on the computer. Uh, I can create this very realistic portrait of our rainbow scarab beetle. The other advantage, of course, of this approach is that the beetle is now within my digital collection and I can use it for any number of other projects. And it's also been rigged so I can animate it and I can basically make it do whatever I'd like it to do. One thing I've never gotten to on this particular project is wings. It's hard to believe that something like this actually flies around, but it certainly does. So probably the next step when I return to this model is to add some wings and see if I can actually animate the wings unfolding. So I think that's also a very interesting uh, process to illustrate. I hope you've enjoyed this behind the scenes tour of my digital rainbow scarab beetle model. 
You can find out more about how I'm using the technology to help educate the public on entomology on our website at Entomology Animated. There are also more videos, some that cover insect vision. I've also added some tutorials on the website through YouTube that offer a much more in-depth explanation of how I created this model as well as some others. So I've created some 15 or 20 different uh, beetle models that I'm proud of. Uh, however, there's an estimated some 400,000 species of beetles in the world. So I'm not sure I'll have time to get them all. Uh, if this approach to scientific visualization interests you, I highly recommend jumping in and giving it a try. There's a ton of great software out there. Some of it, such as Blender, is free to use. I think you'll be amazed at what you can do as long as you're patient and curious.